abortion, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and the future of abortion rights. I am Jeffrey Rosen, uh, and it is great to be back in Aspen, and it is such a privilege, friends, to be here with two of America's great constitutional scholars of diverse perspectives to help understand the constitutional and legal arguments at the center of the Dobbs decision. This is a panel about the most controversial constitutional question in American life. You've been hearing and reading heated commentary on both sides of this decision. The purpose of this session is to open our minds to the best constitutional arguments on both sides of this decision so that you can understand them from a constitutional perspective and then make up your own minds. And that's why it's so important that we've convened our two panelists here. I'm going to begin by reciting an inspiring mantra that I always use to begin programs at the National Constitution Center because it's a kind of nonpartisan incantation that helps put us in the right mood for the learning ahead. So here we go. The National Constitution Center is chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And that's what we're going to do in the next um, uh, hour and a half. We're going to set aside our political views about whether or not the right to choose should be protected or should not be protected and try to just understand what the Supreme Court has said about what the Constitution means. All right, um, before I introduce our panelists, I also have to note, as Elliot Gerson just reminded me, we're sitting in an especially significant place with regard to the history of abortion rights in Roe v. Wade. Just feet from where we're sitting are buried the ashes of Justice Harry Blackman. And Justice Blackman cared so much about the Aspen Institute that he instructed that his ashes be placed in three places. First, just steps from where we're sitting here in Aspen. Second, at the Mayo Clinic, where he was the counsel and where he tried uh, in the Roe opinion to express the professional views of doctors. And third, just outside his window at the Supreme Court. So this is a meaningful place to have this discussion about the end of Roe v. Wade. And I should say, you know, I know I'm asking a lot of you to set aside your, your, your preconceptions for this time, but I, I think it's important. So let's see if we can do it together, and then um, we'll uh, learn together. Um, and we're very fortunate to learn with Melissa Murray of NYU Law School and Sharif Gerges of the University of Notre Dame Law School. Melissa and Sharif are among the most thoughtful, uh, illuminating, and uh, brilliant uh, commentators on the Constitution. They have very different perspectives on the constitutional merits of the Dobbs decision, and it's really meaningful that the Aspen Institute has brought them together to be in conversation about the decision. So welcome, uh, Melissa and Sharif. Um, it's just great to see you both. Let's begin with Justice, uh, I want to begin with Justice Alito's uh, majority opinion, then talk about Justice Thomas's separate concurrence, then about Justice Roberts's position and about the dissent. And then we'll think about the implications of this decision for other cases, including same-sex marriage and contraception. So Sharif, Justice Alito said that Roe v. Wade had to be overturned because the text and history of the Constitution did not support a right to abortion, and he had an extended historical analysis about why a tradition to choose abortion was not deeply rooted in American history. Tell us more about the details of Justice Alito's argument about history and tradition. Sure, and before I do, I want to say a quick thank you to the Aspen Institute and to Jeffrey and to Professor Murray uh, for including me in this event. I'm thrilled. I winced a little bit when you said two great constitutional scholars. I've been listening to Professor Murray's podcast for longer than I've been a professor, but uh, I'm really, uh, so I'm really grateful to be here and look forward to the Q&A as well. Um, I think you just accused me of being old. No, no, it was not intended. It was not intended. It's, uh, it's just a, a hint of how, how novice I am. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, so with that, so I think that one overview of what, um, Justice Alito's opinion says is that, uh, just on the merits now, and then we can talk about stare decisis as well, the, the argument about whether to stick to the precedent because it's precedent. He said, look, so the, the Constitution doesn't explicitly mention abortion, um, which means that if there is a constitutional right to abortion access, uh, 
Um, it needs to be an unenumerated right, and typically that's been ascribed to the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, the idea is that even though that guarantees you um, a fair proceedings before we take away your life, liberty, or property, there are some forms of liberty that you can't take away at all. Um, and then he applies the traditional test for whether something is covered under the due process clause in that substantive sense. He says, it's gotta be deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions, that that's the way to separate a court, sort of a, a judge's policy judgments about what should be protected from um, what the Constitution or the people by enshrining the amendment have protected implicitly. And then he goes through and he says, from the 1200s or so up to 1960, there were no statutes or state or federal cases or English cases um, or treatises or law review articles that suggested that there was uh, a right to abort. By the time of the 14th Amendment's ratification in 1868, some three quarters of the states had expanded their um, criminal penalties for abortion to go to apply from conception onward. Um, and then the most controversial part of his historical analysis, he says, even before those statutes, which, which he treated as the most significant tell, given the fact that it's that amendment that we're interpreting, um, the, that abortion access was deemed unlawful in some sense at all stages and criminal from quickening onward. And just one more word on the un unlawful in some sense, he just meant, he, he suggested that even though it wasn't itself criminal before quickening, it was subject to lots of heavy legal burdens um, that, that we can talk about. Thank you very much for that. So, Melissa, the liberals uh, accuse the conservatives of playing whack-a-mole with history. Um, in this case and in other cases this term, including the gun rights and religious liberty cases, and they say that um, Justice Alito's account of history both fails to account for the pre-quickening protection for abortion during the founding era and also for the liberalization of abortion laws uh, from the 1950s onward. Tell us about the liberals' critique of Justice Alito's account of constitutional history. So the liberal critique proceeds on two fronts. One that I think focuses on this idea that just because something is not explicit in the Constitution, it's not a right to be protected. And I will just say there are a lot of things that we deem constitutional principles that are not explicit in the Constitution. So executive privilege, which we have heard a lot about over the last six years, is not explicitly enumerated in the Constitution, nor is qualified immunity, which we've also heard a lot about. So just because something isn't in the Constitution doesn't mean it's not there to be protected. And in fact, the Ninth Amendment says the fact of enumeration is not intended to disparage the existence of other rights. So the Ninth Amendment explicitly contemplates the prospect that there will be other rights that are not in the text of the Constitution. So let's just start from that premise. If you want to be wedded to the Constitution, there is actually a constitutional hook for unenumerated rights. With regard to the use of history and originalism, let me just say and sort of back up a little, the entire notion of originalism is a conceit from the 1980s when conservatives really viewed the Warren Court and much of what the Warren Court had done, especially in the area of the rights of criminal defendants to be activist and excessive and extreme. And the argument went that these judges were simply ruling in a way that was about their own proclivities, not really wedded to the law itself. And so originalism arose as this idea that if we focus solely on the intent of the framers at time one, when the Constitution was drafted and ratified, or alternatively, in the case of the 14th Amendment at time two, where the Reconstruction Amendments are drafted and ratified, then we will be guided by their intent and that will restrain the discretion of judges. Um, what we've seen here, though, is an originalist argument that ignores a lot of the history around the abortion right. In particular, the fact that the 14th Amendment and its grant of liberty and the protections for liberty with the protections of due process was intended to respond to the fact of enslavement and indeed to be an abolitionist notion. So the framers of the 14th Amendment explicitly understood it alongside the other Reconstruction Amendments to be responding to the conditions of enslavement. So the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, the 15th Amendment gives African American men the right to vote, and then the 14th Amendment speaks to the conditions of enslavement and repudiating them. The idea that those who were enslaved had no control over their bodies in any sense, 
And they weren't just talking about labor, they were also talking about sexual coercion, which was widely known. It is discussed and documented in Uncle Tom's Cabin, the most widely wed book of the age. They also were responding to the fact that those who were enslaved had no control over their families. Their children could be ripped away from them at a moment's notice. Their marriages were not recognized by the state. All of this was encompassed in that grant of liberty as the framers of the 14th Amendment understood it. And so if you think of it in that sense, these unenumerated substantive due process rights that the court now condemns are actually embedded in this abolitionist ethic that is intended to repudiate the conditions of slavery and imbue to those formerly enslaved persons the same kinds of fundamental human rights that other citizens had enjoyed for so long during that period from the founding to the end of slavery in the 1800s. And so that is all missing. Also missing is an account of the criminalization of abortion, which actually proceeded at the end of the Civil War um, from a kind of demographic anxiety that native-born white women were using contraception and abortion in order to control their fertility and to keep their families to manageable sizes. And their immigrant sisters were not. And so there was tremendous anxiety during this period following the Civil War that the demographic character of the nation was changing. And so the decision to criminalize abortion in wide numbers, and this is what many of those state laws come into being, is really responding to that fear that America will not be the kind of nation it was at the founding. And so none of that is part of the context that is underlaying this decision. Instead, we get the selective cherry-picked notion of history, and I'm fine if we want to talk about the history, but let's talk about all of the history because it cuts in a lot of different ways that the court does not acknowledge. Thank you for that powerful and eloquent summation of the history of the 14th Amendment and for the brief that you filed in the Dobbs case with other distinguished historians, arguing that because of the gendered laws that were adopted around the time of the 14th Amendment that for the first time in American history banned abortion throughout pregnancy, um, and because of their anti-woman and anti-immigrant bias, laws restricting abortion, in your view, violate women's equality as well as liberty. Uh, Sharif, uh, Justice Alito responded briefly to the equality argument, which had been embraced most powerfully by the late Justice Ginsburg. Um, Justice Ginsburg argued, citing history like that that Melissa has invoked, that restrictions on abortion impose burdens on women that are not imposed on men and prevent them from making their own life choices and choosing their own careers. What was Justice Alito's response to that argument? Sure, so it was, uh, it was an argument that was, that was made most forcefully and clearly in Professor Murray's brief. Um, it was not relied on by the clinics or by the United States, um, and I think regretfully, in that case, and, and in, in, as a result, perhaps, it's a short treatment, as you said, and it basically relies on two precedents that say that a regulation that targets a medical practice that's only, um, that only applies to one sex is not necessarily um, sex-based discrimination unless there's evidence of animus, sexist animus behind it. And then another precedent that says that we don't need to posit sexist animus to explain opposition to um, abortion access. Thanks so much for that. And Melissa, uh, Justice Alito says that these two cases preclude accepting your argument. T t uh, tell us your response about why you think the court couldn't overturn those cases if it was able to overturn Roe v. Wade. Well, as you say, the court has been very casual with precedent and sorry, decisive. So let's not stop there. Let's continue. And if you want to overrule some of these other cases that cut against the argument, I'm all for it. But there are also precedents that follow the two precedents that he cites, among them um, United States versus Virginia, where the court invalidated the state of Virginia's um, admissions program, which prevented women from applying to and being admitted to the Virginia Military Institute. Justice Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion in that case. And one of the things she noted there was that there had to be an extremely persuasive justification that the state had to proffer if they were going to explicitly exclude on the basis of sex. And so our argument here was that if you read all of these cases together, I mean, and it's, you have to read these cases together 
because the Constitution does not speak of women at all. The 14th Amendment doesn't speak of women. It is not until the 1970s, the same time that Roe is being litigated, that the Supreme Court actually begins the work of reading women into the Constitution. The decision that begins this, 1973's Frontiero versus Richardson, is decided the same year as Roe versus Wade. So to say that the question of where women stand as constitutional beings begins and ends in 1973 is a fallacy. There is more that follows. And the court's decisions on these gender-based, sex-based discrimination cases really do say more about what is required of states when they make efforts to discriminate on the basis of gender explicitly or to discriminate in the provision of certain or in, in the restrictions on certain services that are likely to be used by one gender, perhaps exclusively, uh, like abortion, for example. And so our view is that if the state acts to restrict abortion in a way that is not necessarily about health or safety, but rather is about imposing a particular sex-based role on women, then that is the kind of sex stereotyping that this court from the 1970s forward said was absolutely impermissible as a matter of equal protection. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Sharif, this question of whether or not to overturn or extend these 70s era precedents raises the second big question in the Dobbs case, which is the test for overturning precedents itself. And Justice Alito set out five prongs for deciding whether or not to overturn a precedent. First, was it egregiously wrong? Second, the nature of its reasoning. Third, have there been changed facts and circumstances? Fourth, was the uh, precedent workable? And fifth, have people come to rely on the precedent? Walk us through those five prongs and tell us why Justice Alito concluded that Roe should be overturned. Sure, can I say a brief word about the history as well of the- Of course. So the, it, it's true that there are comments, and, and Justice Alito later in the opinion talks about comments, um, from some lawmakers and some supporters of the laws that expanded uh, criminal penalties for abortion in the 19th century um, that were to the effect that Professor Murray's talking about. There's also vast evidence, even in some of the articles that first brought to light these troublesome comments. Like for example, in Professor Siegel's um, article, Reasoning from the Body, Reva Siegel, the, uh, the co-filer of the amicus brief, that point out that the, it, she, she admits that there's a lot of material as well that shows a concern for fetal life. And it's not an accident that it came about at that time. There were developments in biology and in medical science and the knowledge of embryogenesis that it contributed to that. So in 1827, the year before the statutes that began to expand these, these penalties from 1828 up to 1868 and on, to, and on from there, the, dis, the, human, the mammalian ovum was discovered. And so people's understanding of how embryogenesis works and the idea that there's a kind of continuous development of a single self-directing organism from the point of conception onward, that it doesn't ha there's not some magic moment at seven weeks or at 15 weeks, um, was a huge influence on this. And it was led in, it, and you can see it in the medical and legal treatises of the time. You can see it in um, the advocacy by a lot of the physicians at the time. And, and I think even in the, in the modern era, the, the roots, Daniel Williams has a, has a book in the last few years showing that some of the roots of the anti-abortion or pro-life movement, even in our own day, come not simply from sort of Republicans who are skeptical of state power, except they want to use it here, um, but from New Deal era civil rights advocates and activists, um, from people, including Democrats, uh, at the time Joe Biden, Al Gore, uh, Bill Clinton, Ted Kennedy, began their political careers very strongly pro-life. Uh, Joe Biden supported an amendment to overturn Roe v. Wade towards the beginning of his career. And so there was a kind of, there's a clear concern for this as a civil rights and human rights issue, both in the contemporary era and uh, before that. So it's, a, it's in that kind of context that the judge has to come in then and say, do I credit the claims that this is about protecting innocent fetal life? Um, or do I pick on the few comments that um, that suggest more nefarious motives. And that's a complicated question in a bunch of areas of law and later in the opinion, he discusses why he's treating it the way he, those comments the way he does. On stare decisis, so he says, look, it's true that precedent deserves weight, so he doesn't take Justice Thomas's view that once you think the precedent is demonstrably erroneous, it must be overturned. But he also says that everybody agrees that it doesn't always get deference, that sometimes it's worth overturning. And then he applies a kind of test that's been talked about in lots of precedents about when to overturn precedent. 
which hinges on a couple of things and that you can think of them in kind of three buckets. So one is how poorly reasoned was the original precedent? Was it egregiously wrong or just a little bit wrong? If it's 51-49, we're not gonna touch it. If it's really badly wrong and we can show that in a rigorous way, that counts in favor of overruling. The second is what has its impact been both on the law and in the real world? Um, has it distorted other areas of law? Has it been ro eroded by developments since it came down? And the third is reliance interests. Have people relied on it in such a way that if we took it away from them now, they would be worse off than if it had never been there in the first place. And he goes through an analysis of each of those issues and says it was egregiously wrong. Um, it was wrong by all these criteria, and it's not just that it didn't have our view, but that its historical reasoning was either irrelevant or badly flawed. It talked about ancient Babylon, or it talked about um, uh, historical claims by, by general counsel for NARAL. It was, is what Roe treated as its main historical authority, its only historical authority, in fact, that later turned out to be debunked, in, including by some pro-choice scholars. So it was, it was wrong in its own terms. Um, on the second prong, he says, it's distorted many other areas of law, um, from the mundane to the, to the large, from you know, procedural norms to free First Amendment norms and so on, um, because lots of courts have tried, have bent over backwards to make room for this right, even when other kind of principles of law would undercut it. And then on the third uh, front, he, and he talks about the, the politicization of the judiciary and the, and the legal process in general and the confirmation process of the court. And then at the third step, he says, is it detrimental reliance? And he says there are two conceptions of reliance you can think of here. So one is this kind of concrete one that I was talking about earlier. Does the precedent leave you worse off? Uh, does taking it away leave you worse off than if it had never been there? And he cites a passage from Casey that I think is best understood as Casey entertaining a certain answer to that question, where Casey, and Casey says, now you might say, well, um, no, there isn't the right kind of reliance here because reproductive planning could take immediate account of any changes in abortion law. And then Casey goes on to say, that's not the kind of reliance that we think is relevant here. And I'll say something about that in a second. So, but, but Justice Alito says, that's the kind of reliance that our precedents about reliance are talking about. And since it's not at issue here, that, that reliance interests don't cut against overturning. He, turned, he does address the kind of reliance Casey talks about. And he says Casey talked about a more general sense of reliance, which is about the idea that people, in particular women, have come to identify and define themselves and their relationships around the existence of this precedent. And he says that is both not the relevant kind of reliance and according to our precedents, it's, it's brand new to Casey. Um, it would prove too much because you can imagine the same kind of argument being made about lots of precedents that are badly wrong, that everybody agrees should be overturned, but that particular communities may have been, felt particularly attached to. And in particular, one reason that it hasn't been a part of our law is that it's a very hard kind of reliance for judges to assess. And so for all those reasons, reliance doesn't cut against overturning. Thank you for so clearly setting out for our friends the reasons that Justice Alito lays out for overturning Roe. Melissa, the liberal justices take strong issue with this application of precedent. They say that this is uh, merely about power, not about respect for law. And Chief Justice Roberts in his separate concurrence says, regardless of how you come down on this question, no one can deny that overturning Roe will be seriously disruptive to the legal system. Tell us why both the liberal justices and Chief Justice Roberts strongly reject the majority's approach to stare decisis. So the three liberal justices and the chief justice um, are in accord, even though they are not necessarily aligned on all of the issues in this case, but they're in accord on this question of stare decisis and respect for precedent. And, and one of the things I, I wanna point out, this terrific summary of where Justice Alito comes out on the various factors for overruling a case, um, but there is considerable reliance on the first, the idea that Roe is egregiously wrong, and even as Justice Alito relies on this notion that Roe is clearly erroneous, he does not grapple with the fact that this clearly erroneous decision didn't look clearly erroneous to preceding courts that had affirmed it in earlier go-arounds. And, and that is something I think you have to wrestle with, and it's at the heart of the liberal critique of the majority, 
how can this not be a power grab if we have reopened and reappraised this case before and upheld it for all of these different reasons? How can this be different than it was in 2020 when we looked at June Medical, when you had an opportunity to reconsider the right to abortion? How could it be different from 1992 when we took on the same question in Planned Parenthood versus Casey but upheld the right to choose an abortion before viability that was enshrined in Roe? The only thing that is different, the liberal dissenters tell us, is the composition of this court. The fact that this court has gone from being a delicately poised five to four conservative majority to an overwhelmingly conservative six to three super majority. And that's actually available and evident in the litigation posture of this case. When this case was on certiorari to the court, Mississippi's ask of the court, its request in its petition for certiorari was relatively modest. We don't want you to do anything but decide whether viability is still a salient marker in the court's abortion jurisprudence. That was before September 2020. September 2020, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passes away unexpectedly. She is very swiftly replaced by Justice Amy Coney Barrett. And when Mississippi files its brief before the court in this case, in the fall of 2021, suddenly its ask is much more assertive and much more enormous. Now they're not talking about tinkering at the margins. Tell us if viability is okay or what is viability for this purpose. Now they're explicitly asking the court to overrule Roe versus Wade. That simple change in litigation posture, the liberals say, tells you everything you need to know about what this is. This isn't necessarily about what the law says, but rather what six people are telling us the law says. Thank you so much for that. This has been a superb uh, account of the major constitutional arguments for and against the decision in Dobbs. There's one other large question that I want to put on the table before taking a few questions and then moving to the next stage of our panel. And that is Justice Clarence Thomas's suggestion in his concurring opinion that the same logic that led the majority to overturn Roe should lead to the repudiation of other cases that rely on the substantive due process uh, right to liberty, including cases involving same-sex marriage and contraception. Sharif, tell us about Justice Thomas's argument and whether or not you agree with it. Yeah, so Justice Thomas says the due process clause, which says you can't deny anybody life, any person life, liberty, or property without due process. I can't jail you or fine you or otherwise without giving a fair trial and so on. Is just about process. It doesn't protect any substantive right. And he thinks it's a kind of incoherence to say that there's a substantive component to a procedural right. So he says any of the cases that have relied on substantive due process, I think should be re-examined. And he said that in the past, um, and he's saying it again here, Critically, he's not saying for that reason we would definitely have to reject all of the substantive rights. He says that we have to re-examine in each case whether they're protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which might protect unwritten rights, whether they're... What's I'm going to interrupt you, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> but he, no, he's clear, I think he's clear that Griswold, I assume he thinks that Griswold was wrongly decided. Assume nothing. <laughs> well, well, instead of assuming, <laughs> instead, instead of assuming, what would Justice Thomas's argument for distinguishing Griswold, which is a case that recognized the right to use contraception in 1966, and Roe be? Oh, no, sorry. I said, I, I think he probably thinks Griswold is wrongly decided. Is wrongly decided. Yeah. Oh. But I, but I don't, and, think, and, 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 I don't and, think you would get, I mean, I, here, I'll make a prediction. There are tapes, okay? You can, you can throw this back at me. I don't think you will get more than two votes for that proposition I ever. And so I don't think it'll come up because I don't think there's any appetite for banning contraception. But I don't think you'll get more than two votes even so, on the court. Okay, so <laughs> this is an important uh, discussion you're having and it was had by the majority as well because remember, only n no one joined Justice Thomas and Justice uh, Ma Alito's majority opinion said don't worry about abortion and about contraception and same-sex marriage. But the liberal dissenters said, um, this is what the majority promises, scouts honor. And Melissa, that sounded uh, to me like a line written by Justice Kagan and had her yeah. mark on it. 
why was Justice Kagan skeptical of the promise, and tell us analytically what could be the logical reason for having confidence in the majority's promise or not. So again, Scout's honor is no hedge to the exercise of absolute power. Um, Justice Kagan, writing for this three dissenter um, opinion, essentially says that the logic that the majority uses to overrule Roe is easily extended to any of these other substantive due process rights, including the right to use contraception, the right of individuals to engage in sex outside of marriage, same-sex sexuality, same-sex marriage. Uh, there's no limiting principle here beyond the court telling us and giving us these assurances that this is only about abortion. Justice Alito tells us that Roe is a constitutional apostasy because it is unmoored from constitutional text and it's not deeply rooted in the traditions of this country. You could say exactly the same thing about contraception, about same-sex sexuality, about same-sex marriage. And all of these rights flow from the same font, that substantive due process guarantee of liberty from which the right to abortion also flows. So if you cut down the right to abortion, there is nothing principled that stops you from reaching these other rights. And to say otherwise is gaslighting, pure and simple, which is why I, for the first time in my life, thanked God for Clarence Thomas when this opinion came out, because I have been saying this since the draft opinion first leaked. Like, there is no limiting principle here, and all of these other rights are in jeopardy. And everyone is like, no, they said abortion is different. It, like, it's not the same. There's no political appetite for this. Justice Thomas tells us, of course this is where you go next. And, and, and Sharif is exactly right. Um, he says the substantive due process clause cannot be the font for this individual rights. Instead, it might be something like the privileges or immunities clause. If you were a good student of constitutional history, you will know that in 1873, in a series of cases called the Slaughterhouse Cases, and then another case called Bradwell versus Illinois, a very conservative Reconstruction Supreme Court essentially cut off the Privileges or Immunities Clause as a font of individual rights. It did not go so far as to grant rights to individuals that, that were fulsome. And interestingly, the Bradwell case, which I just mentioned, is a case in which the Supreme Court credits the state of Illinois' refusal to a woman who is amply qualified a license to be a lawyer at the bar. Um, so again, if we're not going to do this under substantive due process, I don't know that privileges or immunities is going to take us far. And Justice Alito's casual dismissal of the Equal Protection Clause doesn't leave us many other options in the 14th Amendment. So yes, we may reappraise and reexamine these other rights, but I'm not sure that there exist other fonts of constitutional authority for actually protecting them. So Justice Thomas lays this out. Sharif is right, he is writing for himself, no other justice joins him, no matter. That's often been his position on this court. He's often written for himself. The intended target is not necessarily his colleagues today, but rather the lower federal court judges and the world outside of the Supreme Court where individual litigants are going to line up to bring cases challenging these rights and they are going, these arguments are going to be perfected in the lower federal courts, and then they are going to percolate up to the Supreme Court, and I'm pretty sure once they get there, we will find five votes for them. Thank, well, we're both thank, on record. Well, thank, now we're on record, yes. Thank you for that. I must ask, though, Sharif, because we can edu educate our audience. What grounds do you believe that the uh, other four conservative justices would embrace for distinguishing, say, Griswold from the majority. Our, my teacher and our friend Akhil Amar said, oh, don't worry, Griswold is different because Connecticut was the only state of its kind in 1966 that banned contraception, and therefore, as Justice Harlan said, there was a tradition for protecting contraception in 1966. Is that the distinction that would be used, it, or are there others? So, so I'll try to be quick. There are a couple things. So one is, I think some of them some of the justices would place under different clauses. So I think the Equal Protection Clause is a stronger basis for Loving versus Virginia and to racial marriage. I think just, I would bet that just- Well, he never mentioned interracial marriage. Right, I would bet that, I would bet that justice- <laughs> That's right. But other, adv other critics did. I, I bet that Justice Kavanaugh would uphold um, Obergefell under the Equal Protection Clause. We have, um, so, so one question is other, other sources of rights. Another set of, issues is the stare decisis analysis. And so the reliance factors 
um, look very different for those. The workability of the legal doctrine is very different for the doctrine that says you're allowed to have access to contraception versus the doctrine that says you can't have undue burdens on the right to abortion, but you can't have due burdens and so on. And then the third one, let me just brief, this is the one that's in the opinion itself that's supposed to distinguish everything else. He says, look, the parties, okay, you can have two, they're basically, the opinion is suggesting there are two ways to be deeply rooted in history. You can be deeply rooted on your own, so we've always protected access to abortion, so he says abortion's not like that. Or you could be integral to a broader right to privacy or autonomy that is deeply rooted. So maybe contraception in isolation wasn't, though Akhil Amar says it was, um, but w wasn't it though? It was, it was the only state of its kind. It was That's the what only. Holland said. That's right. That's but was right. it not the? I'm, here I'm. No, just it was. It, uh, he's right. As far as I know, he's right about the empirical claim that there was no, there was no other state that, uh, that banned the use. And so, forgive me, but so why does Justice Thomas think Griswold was wrong, given the fact that there was an overwhelming history no, well, for supporting the right? So I think he, I think he definitely thinks it's bad, bad for being based on substantive due process. I don't know. I guess I should have said I don't know whether he thinks it's it's wrong in some. It, that it's impossible to rescue under any other provision. But the, but the majority opinion says the, you can be, it, it, it would be enough to be protected as an unenumerated right if you were integral to a broader right to privacy autonomy that is deeply rooted. So why isn't abortion like that? He says, look, all the other privacy and autonomy rights are either they affect only you or they affect consenting parties. Um, or at least they don't harm any non-consenting party. Um, abortion is different because it's at least reasonable and so it's permissible for states to think that it does affect, harm a non-consenting party that makes it no longer just about privacy. There's external impact and so it can't be integral to a deeply rooted right to privacy like the other interests can be. Thank you so much. We're about to move to the second part of our panel which will be wonderfully moderated by my colleague Yamish. Ansendor, but um, during that transition, I think we have time for one question from Melissa, just to keep the, the, the balance um, fair. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. This is a question from a 1A listener to NPR this morning, and it requires some legal argument around treating Dobbs as if the human body would be treated as your own property, as in the Fifth Amendment. Um, you said that abortion is not referred to in the Constitution, property is. Would that be an argument that would move the uh, debate forward? So the idea that the Fifth Amendment um, protects property or more particularly prevents individuals from perhaps putting themselves in position of le positions of legal jeopardy, this is the Fifth Amendment's prohibition on self-incrimination, is already kind of baked in to the right to abortion if you take seriously the notion that the right to abortion proceeds from the right to privacy, which was announced in 1965's Griswold versus Connecticut. There, Justice Douglas, who wrote for the majority, said that um, there were penumbras that were formed, or there was a, the right to privacy formed in the penumbras of various Bill of Rights guarantees, including the Fifth Amendment's prohibition on self-incrimination, but not limited to it. It also included uh, the First Amendment, the Third Amendment's prohibition on the quartering of soldiers in the home, and that all of this spoke to this zone of privacy in which each individual had this opportunity, and indeed right, to be sequestered from undue governmental interference in these sort of intimate aspects of their lives. Um, so, that sort of speaks to the kind of property notion that you're thinking about. And you know, I don't know where that leaves us after we've overruled Roe and we have perhaps called into question whether Griswold will continue to be viable. And you know, with regard to the point Sharif makes that you know, there may be other constitutional grounds on which to uphold these and that Justice Thomas may be open to these, this is not like an argument with my husband. I take no pleasure in being right here. Um, <laughs> I would be very happy to be wrong on all of this, but I don't know that I am, right? I have been saying since 2016 that this was a court, if we just changed a few members, all of these protections would be at risk. And I have watched slowly as this has happened. And, and to be really clear, I don't know that this means that tomorrow, 
we are going to find a challenge to Obergefell and that, that right to same-sex marriage is going to be immediately overthrown. What I think we will see is a proliferation of these religious accommodation or religious objection cases in which individuals like videographers or wedding hall administrators refuse to provide these services to same-sex couples. And you know, this court has been very expansive in its understanding of the free exercise clause and religious liberty. And I think once you begin the process of normalizing the idea that different groups can expect and indeed deserve different treatment in the public sphere, then all it takes is another 30 years, which is what happened here with Roe, and you do have the conditions, I think, in which you could overrule Obergefell. With regard to contraception, I think that's a much closer issue, and I think it's much more immediate, because the question after Roe is really going to be, what counts as an abortion? And we have had individuals arguing as early as 2014 in Hobby Lobby that certain forms of long-acting contraception, like IUDs, are effectively abortifacients. And the science isn't there, but that doesn't matter. And so the whole question is going to be, what is an abortion for this purpose? And we're going to eliminate, if we consider these certain forms of contraception, abortions, they're going to be off the table too. So that's how this is gonna go. Um, thank you so much for this extraordinary conversation about the, about the constitutional arguments for and against Dobbs. Friends, we're going to continue this conversation between Sharif and Melissa this afternoon at 415 in Pepke, where we'll talk about the Supreme Court term more generally. And we're going to continue it now to take a deeper dive into the implications of Dobbs legally and constitutionally, and this part of the discussion will be moderated by the Washington correspondent of NBC News, Yamish Alcindor. Please welcome her. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to dip into this conversation, because it's already pretty spicy. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so you've been talking a lot, of course, about the law and the legal ease, which at first I thought was going to be maybe a little boring, and I realized it's really, really interesting. I also want to talk about sort of what this means to everyday people's lives and sort of the impact on the ground. And the first question I want to go to is Melissa. Um, the first thing that I thought of as a reporter when I heard about this um, ruling was the Fugitive Slave Act and how when states disagree, the states that have different laws often in American history, make the other states or try to make the other states adhere to the laws of their states in the South, that is. So my question for you is, talk a little bit about sort of what we know about how this is going to work between states inter with, with the idea of some states possibly criminalizing other states and, and the legal issues there. Well, so the short answer is we don't know how this is going to go. Um, you know, when this case was argued in December, Justice Kavanaugh suggested that returning the question of abortion to the states would be a very neutral settlement that would simply remove the court from this question. Um, I think that was really naive because I think what we are going to see are interjurisdictional conflicts over abortion, the likes of which we have never seen before. You know, already we have seen Missouri talk about the prospect of extraterritorial prosecution of physicians who perform abortions in states where abortions are permitted, but on residents of states where it is not permitted. Um, that raises a lot of questions. Justice Kavanaugh, in his concurrence, did, I think, attempt to deal with it, and he said very clearly that he endorsed the view that the right to travel would prevent states from limiting the opportunity of residents from leaving to seek abortion care elsewhere. It doesn't necessarily um, relate or map on explicitly to the question of physician liability, but, but I think there, you could make a good argument there. But I'm not sure that that alone is assurance enough to be a hedge because the right to travel is also an unenumerated right that proceeds from a reading of Article 4 of the Constitution. And Justice Kavanaugh was the only member of the court to mention it, although ostensibly I would imagine the three liberal dissenters and probably the Chief Justice might agree as well. But the bottom line is, this is going to be like that period preceding the Civil War, where I think we're going to see a lot of interjurisdictional conflicts, a lot of fights about extraterritoriality. Uh, this is not going to be settled. This is actually going to inflame debate, but new and novel debates that we haven't seen before. 
and Sharif, can you weigh in here um, when you think about what might constitute aiding and abetting, what might um, happen if physicians are criminalized, what, what you think of the legal issues here and, and sort of the ramifications? Yeah, so I agree that, that there are going to be very intense interjurisdictional disputes, and they're in areas of the law where a lot of the legal questions are unsettled, which is going to make them more intense and make the temptation to results-oriented reasoning even stronger. I should say, do you see a case that can be made where at least some states might, might try to criminalize doctors or traveling? So I think the likeliest, I think it's very unlikely that you'll get a ban, that, that, that it, it would succeed. You'd succeed if you used a ban that just said you can't travel out of state. And I think Justice Kavanaugh said that in the opinion basically to head that off. Like, don't try. Don't put me through this again. Here's what I'm going to say on that. But what, what I could imagine is something like a kind of anti-facilitation statute. So something that said, look, in Mississippi, we're banning abortion from X, Y, Z stage. And we're also banning the facilitation of an abortion, whether it happens out of state or in state. So if you're helping someone to travel out of state and to, to get it, or if you're helping them to travel to uh, an unlawful, unlawfully operating clinic in the state, um, we're going to penalize that conduct. And in that case, there's at least a question about whether the right to travel, even assuming it gets enforced, um, would be infringed by that, because it's not targeting it in the same way. So, so, so can I say two things? Um, the fact that there is so much confusion, uncertainty around these questions is, I think, part of the point, right? The fact that we don't know what will happen is likely to chill conduct that may actually be lawful and indeed constitutionally protected. And that might be the point, right? I mean, liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt, right? So the fact that people will worry about what it means to aid and abet, they might not give to abortion funds, they might not fan, fund Planned Parenthood because that might be aiding or abetting. And maybe that's exactly the point here. I will also note that in Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence, he notes that in returning this to the states for democratic deliberation, it leaves it to the people through their state legislatures or Congress to make decisions about abortion. And that to me is really, that's what will settle all of this. If the Democrats lose control of both chambers of Congress and the presidency, this isn't going to be a state by state question. This is going to be subject to federal legislation that will ban abortion outright. Um, and I was going to ask you about sort of what rights could be rolled back. You had a, a really, I think, robust conversation about that. But Jeff, I want to bring you in and just talk to you a little bit about sort of how you view this issue, given that you were moderating, so wanted to let you weigh in a bit. Well, I was really fascinated by the exchange between Sharif and Melissa. And I confess that I had thought Griswold was uncontroversially safe. Uh, every justice. Um, I don't know if Justice Thomas was asked about it, but Justice Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, um, all said that they thought that the right to um, use contraception was deeply rooted in law. And when I teach the Griswold case, you, you begin in con law and you say, Justice Douglas's invocation of penumbras formed by emanations may have been a little uh, broad for the other uh, justices. And in fact, Justice Thomas has in his chambers a sign that says, please don't emanate in my penumbras. He's kind of making fun of, of this argument. But Justice Harlan has a separate concurrence. Justice Harlan was one of the moderate conservatives of the Warren era. And he said, this is an easy case for history and tradition. Connecticut is the only state of its kind in the country that bans contraception. Therefore, there is now in 1966 a strong tradition for uh, not to ban the right to use contraception. The reason, um, Yanish, that I think this is such an important question is that in the guns case, in the religion case, and in the Dobbs case, the liberals all say to the conservatives, you are playing fast and loose with history. You're playing whack-a-mole. Every time history seems to support a liberal result, you're changing the baseline. So in this case, in Dobbs, the liberals say, um, you're focusing exclusively on what happened in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was passed, but not taking account of the broader sweep of abortion protections, both at the time of the founding and after 1868. In the Guns case, they say you are not looking at the original understanding when there clearly was a focus on militia rights, but instead doing this very loosey-goosey sweep of history from the founding until today. So 
I, I, I was, I'm listening, as you know from my moderation, I have no personal opinions about these cases at all whatsoever. I'm not allowed to have any opinions. But I'm, I, I, I'm not, I, I, I'll just confess that I'm not, I, I don't see why, uh, what Justice Thomas's distinction is. And if, and if he won't, and clearly, if, if, if all the justices won't clearly say the right to contraception is clearly protected by history and tradition, then I also have a hard time banking on their promise, as Justice Kagan suggests. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a point in point to make, because there are so many women in this country who are looking at this case now and wondering about their personal lives and IVF and IUDs and all sorts of other things. Um, Melissa, when I, we were talking about this panel, you said something that really um, taught me something, which was how abortion laws came to be in terms of doctors and the roles that they were playing. I wonder when we think about the impact of this and sort of, you, you so articulated what this sort of racial um, worry that led us to sort of ab having abortion laws. I also want to know if you could talk a little bit about the, the role that doctors played. Sure. Um, so you, it was in part this demographic anxiety about the changing nature and demographic character of the country. It was also, I think, coincident with this effort on the part of physicians to professionalize. This is the time after the Civil War where the American Medical Association is being formed. Um, the field of obstetrics and gynecology is sort of coming into being, um, having done most of the field work on the bodies of enslaved women, many times without anesthesia. Um, so it's becoming a professional kind of enterprise. And the physicians very much want to be understood as professionals, and that means getting out of the business of birth and gestation, these faith healers and midwives, mostly women, often women who are minorities, Native American, getting them out of the business of birth, um, discrediting them as viable healthcare providers. So there's an interesting kind of class dimension here, gender dimension, um, but, but that's not the extent of the doctor's um, influence over this issue. So interestingly, the doctors are part of the effort to criminalize abortion after Reconstruction. They are also part of the effort to liberalize abortion laws in the 1960s, in large part because they find that restrictions on abortion prevent them from exercising medical judgment and leaves them open to professional and even criminal liability when they perform their roles as physicians. So you know, there's a case from California called People versus Belouz where a doctor is criminally prosecuted because he has performed an abortion and because he's also referred individuals to another abortion provider that's located in Mexico. Um, these were commonplace, and doctors very much feared the prospect of not only professional liability but criminal liability if they made the medical judgment that an abortion was necessary. So they really led the charge in the 1960s to begin to roll back abortion restrictions. Um, they were primarily interested in having doctors be a voice in determining when abortion was permitted. So the model penal code, it's abortion, um, model abortion law essentially said that abortion, therapeutic abortion could be permitted if it was agreed to by a panel of physicians at the hospital. And so the doctors were like, yes, we like this. We'll be on a panel, we'll get to decide. This did not sit well with the burgeoning women's rights movement who wanted the decision not so much to be in the hands of physicians, but in the hands of doctors. But they managed to come together and coalesce around the question of abortion. And I think Justice Blackmun's opinion in Roe is really the interesting marriage of both of those two strains of thought on the issue. And then, Sharif, talking about the idea of criminalization of, of physicians, I wonder if you think that there's sort of a legal argument to be made um, if doctors are saying now that they might have to be retrained if they can't exercise the medical judgment they need if an abortion is needed. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on whether or not it's, it's, there's a legal argument there to be made that physicians um, should be criminalized if, if they're exercising what they say is their medical judgment. So we, it's, it's a traditional province of the states to regulate um, medical procedures, and we have all kinds of regulation. We also have some federal regulations um, of health and procedures. So I, I think the general idea that a regulation might require um, a, a physician to change the way that they operate will not by itself be the basis of a legal judgment. We also obviously regulate them in a different way through tort litigation. So there's already a kind of established ability 
especially under the state's police powers to regulate for health, safety, and the common and the public good, um, to to do that sort of uh, regulation. So I guess the question is, do you think then that it would possibly be right? It would be um, legally okay to criminalize for physicians if they say I had to perform this abortion because of I have a medical reason to do it, but laws oh, say I no. I, I I disagree with your medical decision. So I, I actually think that the the Dobbs opinion itself provides a pretty strong basis for saying that there is a constitutional right to procedures needed uh, for the mother's life or to prevent serious bodily injury. And that's because, remember, Dobbs says the touchstone is history. The way we figure out whether it's just judges imposing their policy preferences or judges giving effect to what was really enshrined in the Constitution is to look at what's deeply rooted in history. And it turns out that every law, at common law, every statute that was passed in the 19th century by every jurisdiction allowed exceptions for the, for the mother's life, and many of them said life or serious bodily injury as well. So there is a deeply rooted tradition of protecting access in that class of cases, and I think there'd be a serious constitutional challenge if there wasn't uh, a permission for that. And it's also worth noting that it's, it, that, that acts, even today, that, that ability has never been denied. That's speculation. Um, we, the court has not conclusively said that the state may not have an abortion restriction that does not provide an exemption for the health or life of the pregnant person. So, so it may well be the case that if there is a challenge, they may say that, but the question is, in this interim period between Dobbs and whatever that speculative case might be, we will likely have physicians who worry about taking that risk, being found in the wrong in, by some measure, and, and they won't do this. They won't perform this, and there will be many women, pregnant people, who will have complications and will require this and will not be able to get it. So, I mean, I don't think you're wrong that the seeds of affirming this are there in the opinion, but it does not say so. And right now, we are operating in this gray area, sort of purgatory, where we actually don't know what the legal landscape for abortion provision is going to look like, and we will not know until these challenges begin to percolate. So, so quickly on that, the, the, a couple things. Justice Kavanaugh's opinion also says that even under rational basis review, which is the low bar test we're applying to abortion regulations now, Justice Ren then Justice Rehnquist said that there would be a, a right to a life exception. Um, second, it's not, we're not just operating in a kind of speculation about what judges will do tomorrow and now I have to decide. We're, I mean, we're operating also in a world where the, the, the statutes in every jurisdiction do allow for this. And then you might say, well, but the scope of the statute is not totally clear, maybe in some applications. But that's been true un even now and under the regime of Roe, which says after viability, you can ban abortions, but you have to make an exception for life or health. And so if, if there was ambiguity, there may the same kind of ambiguity could have been at stake there. And so I don't think there's a difference in kind between the regime we've got now and the one we've had for 50 years under Roe in that respect. And Jeff, there's also, of course, just the politics of this, the federal government. We heard the president today come out and say that he is for um, doing away with the filibuster for this issue of of, return, of, of creating a sort of um, federal right, again, codifying Roe v. Wade, um, now that it's been overturned. What do you make a, and what do you expect from the federal government? Because I should also note that right now, Democrats just don't have the votes. Well, that's the bottom line. They, they, they don't have the votes. And um, it is poignant to recall that in 1992, they did have the votes and chose not to exercise them. Right around the time that Casey reaffirmed Roe, a bill was proposed when the Democrats had the uh, majority in Congress that would have codified an abortion right. And it failed because it went too far for moderate Democrats. It wasn't content with just codifying a right to choose abortion before fetal viability and allowing restrictions after, but instead uh, didn't allow much regulation throughout pregnancy. And by overreaching, the progressive side of the Democrats made it impossible to pass this bill that had it passed would have made our entire discussion moot. So it's a real reminder about the importance of timing. Uh, it's um, important for me always also to remember Justice Ginsburg's challenge back when she 
criticized not the result but the reasoning in Roe um, back in 1992. She said, had the court only struck down the extreme Texas law, which had no exceptions uh, even for uh, maternal health, and allowed the rest of the debate to work out in the political process, then the liberalization that was going on throughout the country in the 70s would have continued and the US would have passed a law like the one it didn't in 1992 and like most have, of Britain has now, um, uh, most of the world has now passed. Uh, the, so, so now it's back, um, uh, because there's not the votes, as you say, in Congress to pass a federal law, it'll have to be fought out state by state. And what so complicates the politics now is the intersection of um, the fact that some legislatures are going to pass laws that are more extreme than are actually supported by the voters in those red states. So remember, a few years ago, North Dakota passed a ban on abortion throughout all stages of pregnancy, and the people of North Dakota passed a referendum repudiating that because there's only about 22% of the public, even in the reddest states, that supports bans throughout pregnancy. And yet, because of the polarization uh, of our politics, many red state legislatures will pass far more extreme bans than even red state um, people support. One, to, to make things even more complicated, and that's why discussions like this are so important for us all to learn about the various moving pieces, there's the level of state constitutional law. So I've just really been struck to learn that Kansas, the Kansas Supreme Court, recently struck down an extreme Kansas ban on abortion, invoking a provision of the Kansas Constitution that protects both liberty and equality. So basically, a Kansas red state Supreme Court embracing a version of the argument that Melissa made and that the US Supreme Court rejected. The difficulty is that in some states, um, judicial decisions are subject to override by popular referendum, either state constitutional uh, ref ref uh, amendment um, or recall of the judges, because a lot of those state judges are elected as well. So you really see a nuclear explosion where, uh, let's just step back for a second. Ever since Roe to today, the polls on abortion have been relatively consistent. Basically, about 60% or more of the public nationally supports the right to choose early in pregnancy, and 60% or 70% or more of the public supports restrictions on abortion later, after, uh, later in pregnancy, which tracks international opinion. But we're, because of um, the peculiar nature of our uh, federalism, now that we've returned it to state legislatures, Congress is not able to pass a law that reflects this moderate national consensus. And the states are unlikely even to reflect the moderate views of their own citizens. So it's yeah. gonna be a mess for a long time to come. Melissa, Melissa jump in because I have one last question for you before we go to audience questions for a little bit. I, I just wanted to add to what Jeff is saying. You know, this decision purports to return the issue of abortion to the states for democratic deliberation, but it is this court that has effectively hobbled much of the infrastructure of democracy in this country by exempting itself from providing a remedy for partisan gerrymandering, which means that state legislatures are more extremely partisan than they ever have been. Um, this is the same court that struck down key provisions of the Voting Rights Act's pre-clearance requirements, which would have required states with a history of voter suppression to first clear any changes in their election laws um, with the Department of Justice. Um, this is the same court which next term will take up whether we can even allow state courts to review questions around redistricting and state election laws. Um, this court has returned this question to the process of democratic deliberation. At the same time, it's made democratic deliberation even harder. Shreve, do you have anything to add before I ask my last question? Go ahead. Um, so my last question, before we go to five minutes of audience questions, is um, this has all, of course, been so enlightening. The thing that I keep thinking about also is just the women that are going to be impacted by this. I, th the stories that I heard about women sitting in waiting rooms at clinics and crying because they missed the cutoff to get an abortion by a couple minutes. I wonder, Melissa, if you could just talk a little bit about the impact of this. And you said when we were talking about this panel that post-row life might not look like pre-row life. And I wanted to sort of get 
the audience to, 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 to really hear your breakdown of that? So I, I can't even remember what I said because it's been like two weeks. <laughs> what, a, what a two weeks it's been. Um, you know, I do think we are not going to go back to the pre-Roe war of back alley abortions per se, but I do think this is going to be a really difficult period. And, you know, I, I say this having been raised in a community that was very religious. Um, like I was raised in a family that went to church. Um, for a lot of people, this is a deeply, deeply moral question, and I want to acknowledge how difficult that is. Um, you know, one of the things I think that makes this period that we're entering into really hard is not only are we going to see women effectively becoming refugees, trying to find care elsewhere, um, there is going to be this additional layer of judgment on them about these choices, which I think makes it just very difficult to exist. Um, you know, we have employers saying that they will provide reimbursements of service for people who are leaving, to, leaving the state to seek abortion care, but you then have to tell your employer that you're going to have an abortion. I mean, there's a kind of judgment there. You know, I, I, just, I just come back to this idea that this nation was sort of founded on a principle of rugged individualism and a respect for pluralism. We don't all believe the same thing. And there used to be space here for everyone to be a little idiosyncratic. And this opens the door, I think, to a kind of conformity that many of us would not recognize. And I, and I think it's worth reminding um, people and reminding all of you that one in four women in the America have had an abortion before the age of 45, and overwhelmingly the people who are having abortions are low-income women, women of color. So that is how I will end my question portion of this. We're, we have time for probably two questions. I see one quick hand up, so I'll go to you first, and then maybe we'll go in there. Hi, my name is Michael. Uh, I have to say, Jeffrey Rosen, I love these theoretical discussions. But I have one They're problem. not so theoretical. <laughs> well, I have one problem. I own an abortion clinic in Louisiana. And I can tell you uh, that I see the women of the rural South, and they're living the reality of poverty. The women that we see in our clinic very often have children already. And the decision they're making is based on the fact that they don't have the means to support their existing children. So if they can't make the life-defining decisions that are necessary to care for their existing children. So if they don't have that right, what right do they have? Well, I'll just note, and I'm gonna turn it over to, Sh to uh, Sharif and Melissa, that Justice Gin I, I asked Justice Ginsburg many times uh, before she passed away, would Roe be overturned? And she first said, no, as long as Chief Justice Roberts is uh, on the court, he won't allow it to be overturned. She assumed that she would be there. Of course, she passed away and, and Everything changed. But she said, if it is overturned, the effect will be on poor women, that, that uh, women of means will continue to have access to abortion, but the burden will, be, will fall on poor women, and it's urgently important, she said. And every word that she spoke was valuable and meaningful. She said it's urgently important to mobilize to ensure that poor women have the same yeah. access to abortion yeah. as women of means. So I'll just share that and ask Sharif for your thoughts about the situation of poor women in clinics like this. Yeah, so a couple of things. One is, I think in the wake of increasing bans in some states, you will see both the burdens created by difficult pregnancies become more visible, and you will also see the basis, the motivation for moral objections to abortion access also become, in a way, kind of unsettlingly visible. So you'll see people who, who are walking around in a year, well, in a year and a bit, learning to walk because of an appointment was canceled on Friday. Now that doesn't nail the issue. That's just pointing out, speaking to Melissa's point, that the, the kind of deep moral concerns on both sides and that the, both of them will become uncomfortably visible in a way that might change the morality and the politics, the, the, the moral beliefs and the politics of this in some states. On the, on this, on the, sort of the, the women of color, the uh, under-resourced women, the people who are gonna be hit the hardest by these burdens of pregnancy in difficult cases. Well, a couple of things. One is, I, I can speak first just as a, as a pro-lifer myself, I hope that this leads, that the, the pressure and the visibility of those burdens increases the pressure on those states to provide more of a safety net. If they're going to have an abortion ban to provide more of a safety net. The second thing is, the second thing is, 
I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a misconception that pro-lifers are happy to impose the burdens but, un, but unwilling to help shoulder them. So there are, at the volunteer basis, I'd recommend to you the work of Helen Alvare, who's done tremendous work to show the extraordinary extent of financial and other forms of assistance that pro-lifers provide in, in private settings, not just so setting, setting aside the, the, the question of red states policies, um, to help those women in need. And I think to the extent that the increased burdens that you're talking about become visible and they will be more visible and the stories will be there, that kind of assistance will rise as well. And Melissa, last 30 seconds to you. I don't think that people in this country should be dependent on private largesse for what should be a public right. Can I ask? We have to go, so I gave her the last 30 seconds. It's like you're my husband. <laughs> Uh, we'll have to leave it there. So thank you so much for coming to this panel. I'm sure we will have way more conversations about this because there's so much to talk about. So thank you so much.